So if you're joining into the session, I imagine you're aware of some of the damage that chemo can do to feet. And we're blessed today to have two podiatrists to share their expertise and their passion for the care of feet. So Georgina Barr and Sophie Walls are both podiatrists at Maryvale. Welcome to you both. Now, if you have questions, please note them in the Q&A bar at the bottom rather than the chat section. Thank you. I'll hand over now. Very good. Thank you, Annette. So my name is Sophie Walls and my colleague Georgina Barr will be joining you today just to talk a little bit about uh, how the feet can be affected when it comes to treatment in regards to your condition. Um, we, we work within a small podiatry practice here in Christchurch, um, generally um, on a private basis. Uh, we, we serve the community though, and certainly this um, blood cancer and how it affects one's feet in terms of treatment has become a real interest of ours. So um, throughout the session, we will be obviously answering your questions and hopefully, um, you can shed some light onto how we can help you as podiatrists because we can't forget our feet. Exactly. So what we're going to do is we have um, basically a slide per subject. Um, we're going to talk about different things, your feet, footwear, that kind of thing. And at the end of each slide, we're then going to be able to answer questions based on that. So um, you don't have to hold all your questions until the end of the talk. If you have questions, put them into the feed, and then at the end of each slide, we'll just go through and answer them and try and help you as we can go. If we don't get to be able to answer your questions, or if you have questions afterwards, absolutely contact us. You can call, you can email, and um, Facebook, and we can answer your questions whenever you like. So I'm just going to do the screen share and start our presentation. Okay. Excellent. Okay, so today we're going to talk about foot damage and peripheral neuropathy. And what Sophie and I both find is that a lot of times you as the patient aren't in the driver's seat of your own treatment. You've got a lot of different health professionals in the driver's seat, taking you in certain directions, getting you the help that you need. But Sophie and I both feel as podiatry, we want to put you as the patient in the driver's seat. We want to be like your co-pilot or your driving instructor, giving you the absolute best help we can, giving you all the options of foot health that we can, but you having the ability to take control yourself. Cool. <laughs> Cool. Okay, so feet are susceptible to increased risk of trauma from infection. So what Sophie and I wanted you guys to know is that feet are at risk of trauma and infection generally. You know, they're at the bottom of the body, they're so far away, we only tend to think about our feet when we have problems or pain. And everybody experiences that and faces those issues. With blood cancer and leukemia treatments affecting immunity, you guys are at an increased risk of issues. Um, and so we just wanted to be able to give you a idea of how you can self-manage so that those issues have less impact on your life, um, both from the blood cancer and leukemia and also from the treatments you guys are given to help um, deal with those issues. Um, a lot of the medications you guys are on, as you can see from the slide, cause skin problems such as rashes and also from things like swelling in your lower limbs. Yeah, and also whether or not you have additional comorbidities, that will also um, make it more difficult to, to I guess, undertake um, or to undertake care. So it's just about equip, equipping you um, with the right tools and also um, knowing when to ask for help as well and knowing when to reach out. So. Um, yeah, I think our impacted. It's it's about yeah 
knowing when to, to seek, seek help and um, also educating yourselves as to what to do um, and therefore, yeah, having some better options. Exactly. And that is really important when we think about how feet are impacted by blood cancer and leukemia drugs, um, which can cause peripheral neuropathy. Um, <clears throat> research tells us that those kinds of drugs, the quantity or the dose that you're on can impact your experience of peripheral neuropathy, but also um, can experience, you can experience an increased level of peripheral neuropathy or a decreased level based on the drugs that you're given. And just as Sophie says, it's really important when you're experiencing different signs and symptoms in your lower limbs to let people know quite quickly. So your podiatrist, your specialist, your doctor, because oftentimes with damage to the lower limbs, if we know relatively early, there are steps that we can take to limit damage or even to reverse damage. And I guess it's also feeling in control then. So um, if, if you share these experiences, we as professionals, we can reassure, we can um, again educate, and therefore you feel better about your, your full treatment plan um, as a whole. So yeah, exactly. Let's see <clears throat> if we have any questions at the moment. Q&A, no questions. Excellent, okay. Um, so we'll go back into, yeah. <clears throat> video. Back into sharing the screen for you. Okay, so next we're going to talk about ways that your feet and lower limbs <coughs> can be impacted. There are three main areas that we see as podiatrists. The shape, structure and function of your feet, the integrity of your skin and then the integrity of your nails. So starting with foot um, shape and structure and impact, there's a lot of issues that can come, across, come along with blood cancer and leukemia and with the treatments for it that actually increase the prevalence of decreasing the fat pads in your feet. So you have two fat pads, one under the heel of your foot, and one under the ball of the foot. As we get older, these tend to deteriorate naturally. However, again, with blood cancer and leukemia medications, there's a increase to this. And so just making sure that you guys are aware of the increased need maybe earlier than other um, populations to have cushioning in your shoes. And in terms of the skin integrity, we often um, experience thinning of the skin naturally as we age and the elasticity um, becomes less in the skin, making the skin much less durable. Um, it's also increased, our skin um, dries as we, as we age and that then lends itself to splitting, um, especially around the heels. So we'll talk about how we manage that in the next slide, but you may know or you may be experiencing some of that, that skin thinning and the dryness. So that happens at this level of the skin. Our nails are also damaged. Um, obviously with the treatments, our nail beds can be affected hugely, um, whether or not some of you have experienced your nails become very brittle. Um, in some cases, they may fall off completely. Um, when our nail bed isn't, isn't thriving, what happens is we're more susceptible to moisture getting caught in that nail bed, which then will lend itself to infection much more easily so I guess it's it's for you it's annoying what's happening to the nail and why it's happening and how you can again self-manage to prevent anything further um, causing problems down the track. Definitely yeah with nail infections people often get nail infections from really simple things like you know trauma or that kind of thing but again you're at an increased risk because the body has less ability to fight off a nail infection because of 
everything else. And well, right. definitely class the treatment as a trauma to the nail. Um, and whether or not, if some of you have experienced your nails falling off, whether or not they grow back as a, a what we would consider a normal nail or not, will determine on possibly the length of the treatment, your previous history of nail damage. Um, so all of these things are really important to understand. Um, I think once we have an understanding, we're in a better position moving forward to come up with the best treatment plan and you have realistic expectations around um, what's going to be your new normal in terms of, of nail health and also the skin as well. So, and that's our job. That's our job to really be a part of your your go to tool um, in terms of your your foot and foot health. Yeah, and that's actually quite interesting how the alignment and positioning of the feet can impact your skin and your nails. Um, for example, if the positioning of your feet means that you're losing your fat pads, therefore you're more likely to curl or claw the toes in order to offload those areas of pressure. You then need a deeper toe box in your shoes, which you didn't need previously, but you may not be aware of that. And then skin rubbing and um, callus and corns underneath can actually cause a problem. So everything kind of links to everything else and kind of gives you a good overall view of issues you can have with your feet. And just um, on the corns and calluses, some of you may not know what a corn or a callus is. Um, callus is what we would call a thickening of skin. Typically a callus would form over a high pressure area or a high area of friction. Um, and what it is, is it's the skin's natural response as a way to protect itself. We generate more skin as, as that response. So that is typically what a callus is. Calluses can be quite uncomfortable, especially if they are over high pressure areas, because in, in your case, you may not have that fat pad as a way to protect or cushion your, yourself over that high pressure area, and you've now got this very thick skin happening. That then creates a, a pressure which will, will become quite uncomfortable, and in some cases uncomfortable, but in other cases because um, we get neuropathy or we get some changes in the sensation in our feet. Some of you may not even feel the fact that you've got um, a painful callus. So that's why I guess it's really important to understand what your normal is in terms of your feet and just pick up on, on things like areas of callus. Um, and also the other thing, corns. Um, corns are what we call, or that are essentially um, where that cap after the callus is generated, if the callus isn't dealt to um, in a timely fashion, people will develop a corn, which is, I guess, a really localized high pressure area um, and often occurring um, where there's been, again, some friction and or um, even in between toes um, where we can get small interdigital corns. So again, simple things um, to be really mindful of because overall it can impact um, your feet a lot. Definitely. And it looks like you guys have asked some questions, which is really cool. So let's see if I don't completely break the system. Okay, so. You have, um, you're not in any treatment for CLL and you've had bad peripheral neuropathy in your feet. You've talked to other people who also have bad peripheral neuropathy. Have you come across other untreated CLL patients with the same problem? CLL. What do you mean by CLL? Um, if anonymous attendee can um, just clarify CLL, that would be awesome, and we will come back to your question. Um, next question is, what do you suggest for peripheral neuropathy in the feet that persists even five years after intensive chemo has ceased? Yes, so this is something which I find really interesting, and I was actually talking to Sophie about it earlier in the week. <clears throat> I've just attended a rheumatology conference where they were talking about patients on lithotamide and that when you, um, most patients, they're not using lithotamide anymore, they've gone on to other treatments because that drug is known to cause peripheral neuropathy. Um, and so 
interestingly enough, the dose that they use on many rheumatology patients for on lithidamide, because the dose is relatively low when the patients come off that dose and they no longer use it, the sense of the sense of feeling of sensation can come back. So the impact of the drug kind of washes out over time. What I find with patients who I see with higher doses, such as you guys with like cancer from leukemia, the impact of those drugs hang around for much longer. So that is an excellent question, and I'm working on the research for that. Yeah. And I also think there is no one thing, there's no one uh, magic magic remedy. I think it's what works for you. So that could be simply using um, different textures, different um, temperatures on the floor, different you know, fabrics and things. So I think it's about thinking outside the box and no one person is the same. So I know in the past um, for people who, who have had um, neuropathy and have some neuropathic symptoms, we've used various um, different textures inside the shoe, which has then given them, them much more relief. And I pro it probably isn't about um, solving the problem completely, but it's actually about just changing where you sit today and where you sit next week or the, you know, in a month's time and how that makes you feel. And you know, you might come or someone might present one week and they'll be having these sorts of symptoms. And then the next the next week or the next month or two months when they present, they'll have completely different symptoms. So it's actually about being very adaptable and understanding that there is no one thing to fix it it's about a combination of things and if we can help facilitate that and get you to think a little bit more outside the box um, in terms of what may work I guess that's part of our job definitely so there is a um, system that used to be called touch therapy and now it's called contrast massage and that's really what Sophie was talking about about different textures so allowing your feet to feel different um, fabrics, different materials. I often say to people, don't do hot and cold, do warm and cool. So maybe um, a place like a warm flannel on your feet so that the feet get used to feeling certain temperatures again. Um, walk on different surfaces in your home, so carpet or um, vinyl or that kind of thing, and just have different experiences for your feet, wearing different types of fabrics or socks and that kind of thing, can really help remind the feet what normal should feel like, because with peripheral neuropathy, you obviously lose that ability to have that sensation in your feet. Um, chronic lymphatic leukemia. So what I find with chronic lymphatic um, leukemia, thank you for writing that um, when it's untreated obviously it affects the lymph nodes and I find that there are issues with that because the whole point of your lymph nodes are to clear out your system kind of as your like for want of a better word kind of like your garbage disposal getting everything nice and healthy and when that's not working it can impact muscles tendons um, nerve supply, that kind of thing. Um, we use an amazing um, man called Hans who works at Hands On actually. He's really good at lymphatic care. And so what we would recommend as allied health professionals is incorporating your care to other allied health professionals who are able to work with you to provide um, natural ways of helping your lymph system work better. Um, uh, and yeah, giving giving you those kinds of options. So often I talk to patients and they're just because of a lack of access, unaware of all these other allied health people who can offer a variety of different things. It's not just all medication and that's it. Medication obviously is super important and the really good main starting point, but then there's loads of other things that we can do to really help with that. So thank you, that was an excellent question. Um, cool. So feet are always cold. Wool socks and woolen slippers. Is this part of the issue? And what else can I do? 
So just in terms of that question, I would say that the neuropathy is, is the main issue here and that lack of ability to, do, you know, in terms of that temperature regulation. Um, I think, I don't think warm slippers and socks will be, I don't think it's going to be the problem. I think the, the issue is, is the neuropathy. Yes. Also, when the body is under attack, as it were, everything centrally is protected first. So when the body is under attack from like cancer and leukemia or under attack because of the medications you're on for that, obviously the vital organs, the central part of you is protected first, which is why peripheral neuropathy is called peripheral because it's the outer fingers and toes. And so you'll be feeling those kinds of symptoms, that feeling of coldness, which is obviously the nerves not playing their part properly, you'll be feeling that more than you'll be feeling it in the core. So making sure, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, making sure that there are ways that you can really protect those extremities. Sometimes when you're feeling cold in the extremities like your feet, it's because the blood flow isn't going there as quickly. Obviously to increase blood flow, keeping moving. Sometimes moving isn't really what you guys feel like you want to do. But simple things like going for a simple walk can help keep blood flow moving or just simple exercises with the feet, which we'll also go through, can help keep those blood, blood flow moving and um, make your feet feel a bit warmer. We also have a range of creams here at the clinic which aren't contraindicated with your medications, um, which are warming creams. So they're like normal moisturizers, but they've got a little bit of capsaicin in them, which kind of helps give you a sense of warmth in your feet but definitely in New Zealand in the winter it's um, a problem with fingers and toes feeling cold and so again there are ways to find uh, alternative solutions to help with that different fabrics of socks and gloves and also I mean simple things like making sure you know if you are going outside, you are dressed appropriately so that when you come back inside, you don't have that, um, that temperature discrepancy, especially in the winter. Quite often here in Canterbury, what we find is people present with awfully cold feet in the winter because they start their day by going out and getting the newspaper at seven o'clock on a really, really frosty morning. And therefore, that then they don't regulate back to, to a nice temperature um, through, the, through the morning and therefore they've got cold feet for the rest of the day. Also ensuring that um, hosiery is changed and is, is worn appropriately. Um, often people, if they're in damp environments, they typically, or some don't change their, their um, socks when they need to be changed. And if we're perspiring more than usual, um, that essentially is, is capturing moisture around the foot, which in turn will keep the foot much cooler. So there's lots of troubleshooting that one can do if they have um, symptoms of, of coldness. Um, and it's just about you know, thinking a little bit more outside the box when it comes to treatment. And be assured that one thing that may work for you may not work for someone else, but you know, being equipped and informed. Yeah. yeah. And that is a really good follow-up question um, in regards to peripheral neuropathy affecting temperature, sensations, and stiffness. Mm. Imagine if you lose um, are losing feeling in your feet, then you're losing your sense of balance, and then you're gonna tense up because your body doesn't really know where it is, it's kind of loses its proprioception. So when you get that tenseness, even when you stop the medication and you're a few years down the track, unless you've been given foot exercises or foot knowledge, it's really hard for that tenseness to relax. And just on the, the stiffness of the joints, that is um, something that we do see a lot of. So our joint capsules are much more um, much stiffer with the neuropathy. So therefore, um, simply wriggling our toes becomes much more difficult. So therefore, um, you know, those, those things that we may have been able to do where we've been able to move our feet just even sitting aren't as easy as the things were. So, um, yeah. Awesome. All right, brilliant questions. Keep it coming. Now we are going to talk about how we can help you and how you can help you. Um, so obviously just simple things. Perfumed soaps have a lot of chemicals in them which actually do tend to dry out your skin. 
So even though it might have good smells of, you know, lavender or vanilla, having non-perfumed soaps is actually better for you because the chemicals that they use to make soap smell nice can dry out your skin. Um, patting your skin line instead of rubbing it dry, especially between your toes, definitely drying between your toes, but not rubbing, just gently patting will help if you do have cracks or calluses between your toes, you don't want to open them because then it brings in a portal for infection. We definitely want to be quite gentle to our feet. Yeah, and also um, in terms of making sure if you are cutting your toenails, making sure that you're cutting them appropriately. And certainly, um, you know, I always recommend when, when people are cutting their own toenails just to follow the normal curvature of the toenail itself um, to ensure that you don't leave any jagged edges at the side, which may be more susceptible to in growing. Um, especially if there's a little bit of edema going on, this is something that can be quite problematic. Um, and also obviously moisturizing regularly um, with, with a moisturizer. Now, just in terms of, of this help, it's really important to do, but it's also really important to understand why you do it. So typically we would um, we would say if if you can't do it, get someone else that may be able to, to help you with that. Um, and in terms of getting to know your own feet, because you know them best and you know you can sense change um, or you may be aware of change. And I think the key here is if you are unsure, just, just reach out because at the end of the day, if you ask and if you, um, if you get help when you need it, you'll feel much healthier about the situation and you'll be more in control of what's going on. Um, so some will have, some people will have carers that might come into a system with, with some of these basic foot, foot care um, hygiene requirements, but also you may have, um, you know, at home care and you might have a friend who helps you with these, these sorts of um, home care strategies, but it's, yeah, picking up on what's normal and why we do it is really important. So an example of why we do something, so moisturising our feet, um, that would be to improve the skin integrity. So on the previous slide, we talked about uh, how our skin changes as a response to some of these medications um, you're on. <coughs> Moisturiser essentially adds an extrinsic to the skin, so something that we apply to the skin, which will then improve the integrity, making the skin much more much stronger and less likely to break down. So cracks around the heels won't become deep, or they shouldn't become as deep because the moisture has helped helped improve the, um, you know, helped mend them, but also helped keep the area around the, the cracks nice and supple. We do that, we moisturise it because we don't want a pathway for infection. Um, it's, it's incredible where infection or where bacteria enters the body. And often uh, for those who have had cellulitis in the past, typically it's the tineal or the, the the cracks in between the toes or the cracks around the heels, which is that passageway for the cellulitis. So um, that is an example of why we would why we would apply cream or moisturizer to the skin. Another example, again, of, of for an example, cutting toenails correctly is because we want to prevent any additional trauma, um, such as ingrown toenails um, becoming a problem. Also, just in regards to that, sometimes, you know, clippers are really hard to, to find or appropriate clippers if we've got slightly thicker toenails. Um, even a basic emery board or a file, they're really effective in keeping our toenails much, much thinner, less, less thick, um, but also if we're just simply having difficulty cutting our toenails, we can always file them, which will help help manage the, the trauma. The longer and the thicker our toenails get, the more trauma um, they're susceptible to, not only in shoes, simply because of the length and the, the bulk that it takes up in the shoe, but even um, walking around the house and, you know, hitting our, catching our toe on the, the corner of the coffee table. It's all those sorts of things. So if we can just manage manage the length and the, the thickness of our toenails, um, 
yeah, and just being really mindful, the skin is much more fragile, so don't be too aggressive because otherwise you may have a skin tear or something that will lead to an opening, which in turn will may lead to, to infection. So pick up on those things quickly and um, certainly reach reach out if you need any help to a professional. Do you want to touch on these exercises? Yes, but first, in order to help you, with looking after yourself, we have a little bit of a giveaway. <laughs> so we have three packs for you guys um, with a range of um, creams and gels, just different things to help with your foot health that you can look after your feet at home. So what we want you to do is go onto the Maribel Plant Tree website, maribelplanttree.co.nz, scroll to the bottom, sign up to the newsletter, we will put all of the people, names of the people who sign up to the newsletter into a drawer. We'll pick out three and you guys will be in touch for our wonderful little self-care packs. Um, for everyone who does sign up to the newsletter, loads of information goes into our newsletter about how to manage your feet at home and also good ideas that we were actually talking about yesterday about like a foot warrant of fitness. So we've got a few lovely patients who we see already who come and see us once every six or nine months just for a general warrant of fitness of their feet. We can give little tips and, um, tips and tricks and it means that we are preventing future problems. But yeah, sign up to our newsletter and we've got little good tips for you. Or you can jump onto Facebook and just do the comments um, below the post that we just posted in regards to this conference. Do some pop, um, pop your name in it and maybe a little um, comment about what you learned from today's session and we'll add you to the list as well. Now, just in regards to the little gift bag, um, the they do have both warming creams and cooling creams, as well as a gel, which is a very broad spectrum antifungal and an antibacterial. Um, these are all natural products. Actually, the particular product that we've recommended and that are in the, in the gift packs today, they come from a seaweed der derivative. So lots of... Um, Lots of companies out there are very mindful about the likes of perfumes and, and chemicals going into their products. So we, at the clinic, we typically recommend um, the Spirulara range because it has some really great um, properties in it and is it's not as invasive and still got still with some really good um, qualities to it. So yeah, so jump online and do those comments. Absolutely. It's quite interesting. Um, exercises means different things to different people. Really, when we're talking about exercises for the lower limbs, feet and ankles and toes need different force or pressure than other body parts. We are so used to, you know, having these expectations that we can push ourselves to the limits and we need to do big movements with lots of muscle control. But the feet are just little and the toes are just little. There's little muscles there. There's a lot of them. You've got four layers of muscle under your feet, but they are just little. And so in order to look after your feet with strength exercises, with range of motion exercises, there's not or there shouldn't be a big expectation about spending a vast quantity of time or effort with these exercises. Simple things like going for a walk, not necessarily a 5k round the block walk, but starting out, especially if your feet are really sore, walking to the end of your street and back. Um, obviously making sure you've got good shoes, which we'll talk about soon, but gentle range of motion exercises for the ankles don't even have to start with you weight bearing. They can start with you sitting um, in a chair and just doing gentle calf rise kinds of exercises. The most important thing is if you're not currently doing exercises for your lower limbs, you don't want to go from zero to 100. You don't want to be doing nothing today and then try and walk heaps tomorrow. We want to slowly build up um, your strength. I have recently actually had a patient who um, was told it would be really beneficial for them, for their feet, to just get some swimming in. Obviously, non-weight bearing, good range of motion and that kind of stuff. We're actually going to start that patient um, with just moving their feet in water. Um, they're going to sit at the edge of their tub, fill their tub with some water, and then just gently move their feet in water first and build up to swimming. So making sure that whatever exercises you guys do do, whether it is water-based, 
whether it is gentle sitting down, calf rises, where it, where it is trying to pick up a sock or a tissue with your toes, that you want to think about progression and building up to your end result. You don't want to give yourself too much pressure, basically. You've all got a lot going on with your feet and with everything that you're going through. So just making sure that you're kind to yourself with your feet and making sure that those who help you also are aware of things you're going through. Obviously, you don't want to have a personal trainer or a gym instructor who's expecting you to do much outside activity. A lot of medications you guys are on cause photosensitivity, so being out in the sunshine isn't great. So just making sure that whoever looks after you is aware of that and they can build an individual plan which suits you. And I guess, um, again, why are we looking at strength exercises is concerted balance um, and we're more susceptible um, if we have peripheral neuropathy to be slightly under, less stable on our feet so if we are using our toes and wriggling our toes and building the, the little strength systems within our feet um, we we are protecting ourselves from the likes of force and movements. Absolutely right let's have a look here. So just looking at your questions. Okay, so we've just got a bit of a bit of a long question. Um, yeah, so this lovely person feels that they their feet and their lower limbs they're really bound up tight um, they feel really stiff they feel really tight especially around the toes yeah so a great a great option in terms of that feeling of really bound up tight feeling of your lower limbs is a gentle you know non-weight bearing gentle point and flex of the feet and then gentle twisting in and out um, a lot of people still do ankle circles and we don't know why because the ankle isn't a ball and socket joint. I think it's just habit more than anything. So flexing, pointing your feet and then flexing, pointing just your toes and then turning your feet in and out. Doing great big ankle range of ankle circle movements, that kind of thing is going to cause more problems than it's going to fix. And so really thinking about non-weight bearing, so sitting exercises, water-based exercises and then building up to those other exercises is a good idea. Yes, we um yes, we will absolutely give you the website. Um, we also have our email and our phone number um, at the end slide. So we will give you those details. So this lovely person does aqua jogging, which is awesome, and walks, uses a shakti mat. Mm. It's interesting, it may be that um, what you're walking in, so having someone check your footwear, shoes and socks, um, and also it sounds like you're actually doing a really good job of looking after yourself, but it may be that we need to add a little bit of progression to your exercises or exactly what you're doing with aqua jogging. So, yeah, having a chat would be, be really good. All right, let's keep going. Okay. So, peripheral neuropathy. Peripheral, obviously means outer extremities, and neuropathy means um, dysfunction of the nerves. So um, your nerves give you sensation. They tell you when something hurts. They tell you when something is a good touch or a bad touch. Um, when the medications that you're on impact the nerves, sometimes you can have someone gently touch you on the foot, but it feels really painful because the nerves are really sensitive. And so what we're trying to do with giving you kind of advice around foot health is knowledge that sometimes if you're feeling pain in your feet, 
it may not be that you're doing damage to your feet or causing trauma, it may be that the nerves are just unhealthy. And yes, so you'll start with um, maybe a feeling of increased pain in your feet, then you might feel a tingling, um, and that will then increase to a sense of numbness, and that also impacts your muscles. So if your nerves are firing the correct signals to your muscles, your muscles aren't going to work properly, then that's going to cause impact and problem with strength, and then, of course, you'll have balance issues. So as we spoke about before, if you're feeling sensations of tingling and pain and weakness in your feet, that's the time where you want to tell your uh, specialist or your podiatrist or your GP because there are reverse ways to reverse that or at least hold progression. And certainly the specialists and things are very aware of these symptoms. So, and there are alternatives in terms of treatment options depending on what you're experiencing. So, I think it is really important to, and you will have great relationships with your specialists and things to, to really be honest as to how you are feeling um, because they've always got other tools in their toolbox to help you with. So, um, and then uh, often we get referrals from specialists as, a, as an additional service um, to what they're doing to aid with further, further sort of um, measures in terms of the help that we can, can give you as podiatrists. And that goes with your physios, it's the same with massage therapists and things. Um, we are essentially tools in the toolbox that being accessed when you need them. Absolutely. Let's have a look here. Oops. Cool, cool. Okay, so, right. How you can help with your feet and lower limbs when you're doing that activity or other important things. So, uh, things that we don't really think about are um, the different types of socks and footwear. So, I'll grab some examples. So just in terms of hosiers or socks, um, it's really important to, and lots of you will be very different as to what you can toler tolerate, um, it's really important that you get something that fits you well, um, that is relatively seamless because we don't want to create any additional high, high, um, high pressure areas or high friction areas and something that has plenty of um, I guess depth and also that's not too tight because we don't want to be creating um, areas where the skin is being cut and it's creating a crevice um, which could potentially lead to other problems. So as I said Many of you will be able to, to tolerate lots of different things, but if we're looking for, for socks with no seams, seamless, um, that have a nice wide, I guess, neck of the sock or around where, where it lies around the shin, something that's really quite wide. And if you do have edema, something that's able to stretch um, with that through the day and just, yeah, something that fits and encompasses the foot well, um, that is what you need to be after. Also in terms of um, fabrics with hosiery, you really need to be looking for something that wicks away moisture. Often with just a cotton sock, what happens is the moisture gets trapped within the cotton and um, the foot is then left damp and which in turn can be left cold for most of the day without even you realizing. So something that wicks away moisture is going to be much more comfortable for you. And if we're trying to manage um, areas of, of moisture buildup in between the toes and therefore sort of um, infections and things, you, you need to be looking for something that, um, as I said, wicks away moisture to stop it from keeping, um, from being coming damp. Um, so that's a little bit about hosiery. Yes. Do you want to go? Next thing is talking about devices that you can put in your shoes. Now, obviously, um, Mirabel Podiatry is different from other podiatrists. We see orthotics as a tool in the toolbox. We don't just go orthotics for everyone, you know, um, they're going to fix all life's problems. Often what you need in an orthotic is different offloading areas, uh, different pressure areas and that kind of thing. So orthotics may not be right for you just because you see a podiatrist doesn't mean you should automatically be given orthotics. And what we find often with um, previous patients I've had with 
issues of peripheral neuropathy, that actually analgotic isn't the best thing for them. Modifying the inner of their shoe to offload pressure is better. In an orthotic device, you guys are really wanting to look for something which has cushioning on top and support underneath. Something which has two, two tones or two densities is super, super important. You want the support underneath. You want to have that proprioceptive knowledge of where you are in space, but you also want to have something which has cushioning on top, which is really going to offload the pressure and not cause rubbing and problems in feet that already have a lack of sensation. So really making sure that you guys have something that you can use in all your shoes. Oftentimes, orthotics do tend to be quite um, thick as well as quite firm. And so making sure that you're getting something really streamlined, something that you can fit into your shoes and something which has a decent amount of flexibility in it because we don't want to control how you're moving and walking, we want to support how you're moving and walking. So that's really, really important if you're going to go down the orthotic route. And I think um, the next thing is footwear. So often if you are very sensitive, you may only have one pair of shoes that you can tolerate. So in that case, it's really important to work with a, you know, a podiatrist or a health professional to ensure that what you are walking in and what you're able to tolerate um, we can accommodate what you need within that. Um, naturally, we think, oh, you know, everyone, you know, I have a couple of pairs of shoes, they've got flexibility, but that's not always the case. So I think it's as a professional, it's really important, important that we're sensitive to what our patients can tolerate and then working with that um, to ensure that your comfort is maintained and then if your comfort's maintained, everything else we suggest is going to be much, much easier because you're not resisting footwear. Um, if we were to fit someone in a really clunky, heavy shoe because we think it's the best thing for them, sure, but if it's just going to go home and sit in the bottom of the, of the wardrobe, well, what's the point of that? And it's a lot of money. So we're just looking and being very sensitive to what you can tolerate and then working with that in order to build, in, to build in up around where we need the support and things. I mean, I've more recently um, had someone, a patient of mine, who we've just simply worked with a jandal, um, a jandal, and we've applied little pads inside on that jandal, on the top surface of the jandal, or the sandal for this matter, um, just to offload where we need where we need to add a bit of extra cushioning in other places. And you know what, they come back and then they go, oh, I think so for that needs to be tweaked. Well, that's fine. We just rip it off and we, we modify as we go because symptoms are changing all the time. Nothing's ever, ever um, set when it comes to our feet. Um, I think it's just important to be adaptable and work, work with the patient. And in some ways, you, as we've, we've said, you you're leading us as to how we, we need to um, direct your care a lot of the time. So we need that feedback and it's about the time that we're spending with you, the patient, in order to ensure that we're getting that best feedback and then able to deliver something. Absolutely. So we've got, it looks like, one or two questions. And so we will put the contact up. Um, I think we're on time. We've got three minutes to go, oh, which is cool. amazing. Um, okay, so... Last questions. What's your advice about the use of pressure socks for patients with edema? Yeah, so with pressure socks, stockings, I, I, I like them. I think it's really important that they're fitted appropriately, though. So if, if you have someone locally that you can reach out to, I know um, we work closely with a pharmacy down the road who does um, custom fittings as well as um, a pro, you know, proper measurements in terms of, of management. Um, sometimes I find for, for people, you know, there's toeless options and there's toe options. It's about making sure that um, they're not going to create more problems than, um, and also knowing, you know, sometimes I, you know, we get see people that have worn warm pressure stockings for years and, you know, on various days of the week, they don't like wearing them. So it's, it's using them as a, again, another tool in your toolbox and, um, not feeling as though you're, you're bound necessarily, but being, um, you know, 
using them though. I really I rate them. Because if we can keep those legs down, we can get you more mobile. Um, if you've got edematous legs, it becomes much more difficult to move, which then uh, mobility is less. So it's, yeah, no, I, I find them really effective, but making sure that they're fitting well is important. Absolutely. And yeah, we just want to say thank you guys. Um, we've really loved looking after you and giving you advice and happy to look after you in the future. Thank you. It's been fantastic. Such personal and practical help. Thank you both. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Sarah. All good. Thank you.